hardest to ever is really hard because I've done a, about a million practices in my life and <laughs> most have been super hard. I'll give you the hardest one we've done all year, um, in my opinion, with Bob was it's like impossible to get around Austin when there's a home football game. Did you uh, have a scooter there or did you like... No, run? so typically on Saturday, since I'm not a, a UT athlete, I don't get parking. So on Saturdays, yeah. game days, the the students do. And so normally Kobe Crows, one of my best friends, drives me yeah. um, and he'll drive me home afterwards. But I mean, I like was going through my lift super fast so I could get back and because I knew I was going to be late already. So I, And then he still had probably 15 more minutes. So I was like, screw it. I'm going to go find a scooter. And I'm going to hop on a scooter and ride home because I live like five minutes away from campus. But the scooters are disabled. And so I was like <laughs> scootering myself instead of like using the electric cart <laughs> until I got out of like the disabled zone. And so that took like probably an additional 10 minutes and I was all sweaty. And I was like, oh, my goodness, this has been like a morning trying to get around this whole <laughs> it's not even until seven. I'm like, why is everything shut down at 12? But we're here. Free game. This is this is tailgating, man. See, that's come on, man. Cal- that's something that people in California would say because they don't know how to tailgate. But when you've gone to a, a now SEC uh, school, man, it's just a different environment. You don't even know tailgating starts it's, three it's days awesome. before. It's awesome until it messes up my routine. Then I don't like it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> tailgating on my terms. Yeah. Well, we hope you got a protein shake or something. Yeah, I did. I. Yeah, grab two chocolate milks on the way out of the weight room for my scooter ride. <laughs> Sweet, there you go. That's good. Let's uh, <laughs> let's roll right into it, dude. Um, if that's all right with you, uh, thanks for joining us. Welcome to Social Kick. We got the full crew: Dr. John Mullen, Luke Paddington, and fresh out of a Bob Bowman workout on a Saturday. Carson Foster, what's up, dude? What's up? Thank you guys for having me. Yeah, it's been it's been a morning, but I'm excited to be here. This is a tough one this morning, Bob. <laughs> well, t- tell us about the tough one. Yeah. So. Uh, I mean, for context, for the listeners, I'm, I'm about 30 minutes late than, than what we scheduled because I, I had assumed that, you know, Bob's workouts have been, um, you know, he's super efficient with the workouts. So we, with Eddie, it was like, we do a set, then Eddie walks to each lane, talks to us. We have like five to 10 minutes in between a set. Bob has everything written out. And so everything flows super smooth. And like, he's like, all right, next stop, we're going starting next set. Um, and so our workouts have only been, we've been cranking out, you know, six, six and a half, uh, in like hour and 20 hour and 30. Um, and today was long course. It was, I think it was 6,600. Um, but it was like all race pace near max effort fast. Um, and so there was a little bit more rest in there built in a little bit more warm down. Um, and so this was the first two hour workout we've had. Um, but it was a tough, it was like two rounds of, 450s max effort odds from a dive evens from a push on 130 straight into 650s uh back end 200 sp- speed minus one uh two on 50 two on 55 two on a minute and then a warm down in between um and do that two times so it's two 2050s essentially all out damn do you prefer to be able to um, knock it out like that? Is that kind of a nice thing to be efficient and just like having a quick workout? Or um, do you miss sometimes having like a little bit of a, I don't know what you call it, casual, but just like, you know, maybe a little bit more metered, drawn out workout with Eddie style? Uh, I think I prefer, I mean, obviously I'm only three, four weeks in. So I think it's, I'm still getting used to Bob's style, but. Um, I like it. I think, I think there's an added training benefit to that. Um, whereas it's like, it almost feels as if the practice is just one big set, um, like one massive set. So I think there's definitely a training element that I like about it. Um, I miss like the, uh, you know, interactions with Eddie in between sets. Um, I miss (laughs) like the, like Eddie jokes, like coming to the lane, me poking fun at Eddie and, you know, him making fun of me back. And so I missed that part of it. Um, but I, I think for, for where I'm at, what my goals are in swimming, where, um, I would like to be this season or in this next quad, I think it's going to be a good change for me. 
Yeah, I mean, here in 7K, those that swam in the 70s, 80s, 90s, like, God, we were doing like 15K doubles every day. This is nothing. But <laughs> just to hear the difference, though, like having it race pace, going off the block and having so much quality, it just makes such a difference. And uh, it's interesting to see that transition. Yeah, it's it's been that's been honestly the biggest difference is how much energy system changes throughout the same practice Bob uses. Um, Eddie, there was kind of like a central theme. We'd kind of be holding the same energy system, the whole practice. Bob is like, we've touched aerobic. We touch fast kick every single practice. You know, we're, we're doing after the fast kick is almost always a pulse set where we're limiting our breaths. Like you don't get to breathe every stroke. Um, and then it's into a set where it's like descending efforts where we start aerobic and then we'll always finish with something either fast or underwater. So it's just so much of different energy systems all within the same workout, which has been um, definitely an adjustment from working with Eddie for four years. Uh, what's what's Bob's energy like during those sets? Is he a big whistler running up another deck cheering you on? Or is he standing up there watching you? What's his energy and how does that resonate with you? Yeah, yeah, that's that's another huge difference. Bob is um like he's like locked in, yelling at us, like encur- obviously encouraging us. But like, um, I was actually thinking about that during the practice today. I was like, I was like, this this is one of the biggest differences that makes it so much harder. Where Eddie kind of had a lot of trust for the swimmers to be like, I want you to push it, and like because there was such a respect for Eddie. Um, with, you know, almost all of his swimmers, it was like, yeah, we're going to go all out. We're going to race, um, with Bob, there's that same level of respect, obviously, Mm -hmm. but it's also like, Bob is like, no, you guys, if you guys want to hit your goals, you're going to go this pace and he's going to let you know if you're slower than that. Um, and so like today I did backstroke cause I wanted to race Hubie. I haven't done backstroke on like a specialty, a, like a stroke set all year. I've been mainly doing butterfly, but I was hopping in with Hubie today because I was like, this is, I mean, I'm, I'm getting this opportunity to race the 200 backstroke world, or Olympic champion. So I want to yeah. go, I want to race him on a, a 200 backstroke set. So I was racing him. Um, and I went through the first round and I was like, Bob, like after the warm down, I was like, is that about where I should be? Like I, we, this, I'm still, I feel like I'm asking that question a lot. Cause like, yeah, I haven't yeah. done these sets before. Um, and he was like, no, you need to be faster than that. And I was like, Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, but like hearing Bob say that and like, I'm like, Bob obviously knows what it takes to create someone to be a world champion or become a world record holder. And so if Bob's telling me I need to go faster, there's a part of me that's like, I just got to figure it out. Like I got to figure out how to go faster. So like there is definitely a difference in terms of Eddie and Bob's dynamic. Um, I think both of them work, especially for their personalities. Uh, but Bob's definitely been like, on us about hey you're especially with kick because that's been the biggest transition for the i feel like the texas team as a whole is we're doing so much more kick um and so i don't think we're that great at it yet um and i think we're definitely getting better but bob is definitely hammering that home of like if you want to be on this 800 freestyle relay that's going to be really good in march for the college guys he's like you better be kicking this fast Mm -hmm. and so like that was just and i remember that after he said (laughs) that it was like the fastest 50 kick I've ever seen at Texas with, <laughs> with like all the guys. Um, so it works, but it's just, it's, wait, it's, who was the fastest? Uh, I honestly, I'm not one of the, I'm, I'm always towards the top. Hubie, Hubie's probably the fastest kicker. Um, but he mainly focuses on backstroke kick. So he's kicking on his back, which is a little bit faster than kicking on a board. Yeah. Um, because he's a backstroker. Sure. Uh, the fastest flutter kicker, I think on a board that I've seen, I could be wrong on this, but I think Michael Cotter has been going super fast on, on a board. Um, Rex Mauer is good at everything. Um, mm. But it kind of just depends on the day, to be honest, because we're going, mm. everyone's so beat down already. So it's like, kind of sure. depends on who shows up. Right. Do you think, is Bob the kind of person too, where, you know, he can give you that kind of honest feedback when you ask for it? Like, hey, what, what should I be going fast or should I be going faster on these and, and give you like a really quality, um, you know, guidance on that. But I also wonder if he's the kind of tough love person who's, you know, if you're not hitting the standard, if he's going to go, I guess you don't want to hit your goals, Carson. I, I honestly, and so for, for yes, 100% to answer your question. Yes, it seems, it seems that way. With Eddie, it was more of like very much a swimmer led relationship almost of like, especially when you got to the point where I was at, where I was extremely comfortable with Eddie and Wyatt. I view Eddie and Wyatt as family. So I I could tell Eddie anything I was thinking. 
Um, and we could have dialogue about that with Bob. It's like, and this is something that I want out of my relationship with Bob. And I want out of being a swimmer of Bob's is I want him to be able to tell me, no, you're not going fast enough. Like yeah. you have these goals and obviously like I'm, I'm close. I think I'm, I've, I've been successful in swimming. I obviously want more. I, I like, I I'm close to, you know, the top of the, the sport. And so when you're that close, you're like, Oh, I just, like, I want, I, I do want to win a world championship. I want to win an Olympic gold medal. So, mm-hmm. um, I want to have that relationship with Bob and I think he's going to get more comfortable with me and probably feel more comfortable to be able to say this to me as we go. But I want him to be able to be like, no, you need to be faster on that if you want to do this. Um, because that's kind of a tough love that I, I didn't get as much with Ed. Um, and Ed, that's not just, that's just Ed's, not Ed's personality. Um, but uh, that's something I think as, as me and Bob gain a better relationship past, you know, the four weeks we've been working together already. Um, that's something I am excited about um, that I think Bob kind of is a little bit more, you know, not blunt, but like very clear on, I know how to get a swimmer to this point mm-hmm. and you need to be going yeah. this time. Yeah. I remember he Bob also talking about he still he does adapt still he changes and he's been changing a lot so after our podcast he he gave you guys a four inches social kick and he actually wrote it down have have you seen him or has he talked about how he's adapting his style to Texas a bit as well have you seen that has he changed a little bit for the Texas tradition routine guys people personnel what have you um I think in terms of workout structure Probably not, but that's hard for me to answer because I've never trained with Bob before this yeah. year. Um, but from like from what I had heard about Bob's training, it's very similar to like kind of like the stories I heard from Drew last year. Kind of like mm-hmm. you know, Bob sometimes will post workouts or used to on his Twitter account that I used to see. So it's very similar to those. Um, and hearing from Chase in terms of like Bob keeping the culture of Texas, I feel like he's yeah. done a really good job of that, mm-hmm. um, which is super special. I think that was. That when when the coaching hire search was going on for me, especially me being off the team where I was like, oh, we're going to get a good coach. And I think as a professional, I'll be fine because, you know, my job is to swim and show up for workouts. But for these college guys, you know, I think it's important for them that they get the same experience I got in terms mm-hmm. of like the Texas team culture. That's the reason why I went to Texas is because the culture was mm-hmm. so amazing on my visits. And so and I had a great experience uh, as a member of the Texas swim team. And so that was my biggest concern. I was like, oh, just whoever they bring in, I just want them to keep the culture the same as it is or very similar. Um, and honestly, I met with Bob, I think, two days after it got announced. I met with him in Austin in yeah. April to talk to him and meet with him. Um, and that was, I think, the first or second question he asked me. He's like, what are some team traditions on the team that like have been alive from when you were on the team, before you were on the team that we need to protect? Mm-hmm. And so that was such, like a really, really – cool question that he asked and something that made me feel excited for the program was like, okay, he obviously he's going to bring his own like Bob flair to the program, which I think is important. Like Texas, I think needed a new look, uh, needed some new energy. Um, but also he cares about keeping these traditions alive. So in terms of workout structure, I think it's very similar to what he's done. I I hope it is because it works. Uh, It's worked for him. Um, in terms of tradition, it's like definitely some things are different, obviously, but uh, he's done a really good job of keeping the culture um, yeah. the same. So you mentioned a couple days after the announcement, you meeting with them. But if you can go back even further, what was your first initial reaction when you heard Bob was coming in and having this new position created for him? Yeah, the the, the time from like February to March was like, to be totally honest with you, it was super stressful because <laughs> yeah. you know. I'm at this point in my career, like I, I, I'm finishing school right now. So that was like the one thing where I'm like, I feel obligated to stay in Austin. But like when the whole thing, when you hear a million rumors about who the next coach is going to be, you're like, okay, like how would I work with this specific person? I hear this rumor about this person. How does, how have they done with my events? Um, mm-hmm. You know, would it be the smartest thing if I stayed? I, Cause I'm not on the college team. I, me and yeah. Meredith would have a discussion about, okay, where's the best place for us to be? starting a family. We just got married. No, I'm not starting a family as in having children, but like the family yeah. as in me, me and Meredith. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that was a discussion and, you know, over like uh, the possibilities who the coaches were, were going to be. And then we finally just in February, just when we kind of hit a breaking point of like all the what ifs, we were like, 
all right, let's just decide that whoever comes, we love Austin. We absolutely love our people here. We love our life here. Um, let's stay in Austin regardless and let's make it, let's see what happens for a year. Um, wow. And then I think like three weeks later, it got announced that Bob was coming, which, you know, what better coach for my events than, yeah. you know, Bob Bowman, you know, the guy who's creating these summers that, you know, for the most part are, have been some of the only swimmers that have been able to beat me the last couple of years have been his swimmers. And yeah. so, um, you know, I was super excited about that. You know, I think like the, you know, I'm the 4 a.m. I'm like, I think eighth all time, my best time. And I think four of the people in front of me are Bob swimmers. So like what better person to take over the place that, you know, I love, I love being in Texas. And, um, and I think Meredith and I, I think there was a sigh of relief for us where it's like, okay, good. Like we can just relax. Let's see what happens. Obviously it's not a given that like, it's going to work. Obviously I'm going to work my butt off and do everything that Bob asked me. So, it, so I can do everything I can to make it work. Um, but it was just a very big sigh of relief, obviously mixed with like a lot of emotions with, okay, this means that my time with Eddie is definitely coming to an end. My time with Wyatt is likely coming to an end. Um, and that was emotional for me with like, I love these guys. Like I came to Texas yeah. to swim for these guys and these guys became like family. And so, um, there was definitely mixed emotion, um, but excitement, but also just grief for, you know, the end of the coach summer relationship that I have with Ed and Wyatt. Yeah. And, and I bet you were very reflective on the swimmers who moved to, um, our, to Austin from Tempe. Cause you, I know you kind of personality, you would reach out and you're trying to help. You, I mean, a lot of people will struggle with that move to Austin with the sudden announcement. Have you, you know, formed any bonds with like people who have come, the Reagans, the Hubies, the people when they moved them and helped them settle into Austin? Yeah, I, th that was honestly, I felt super like when, when that all got announced in March, it was like, I felt like I was stressed because there was a lot of things going on with yeah. like, the change in Texas. But like, it's nothing compared to the people who had to literally move across the country weeks before trials like that is incredibly stressful and so um it was a weird time where it was like i want to give them space because obviously it's a weird time for them um i'm not going to be like hey can't wait for you to move to austin it's awesome here uh, <laughs> let's grab some beers <laughs> yeah have fun, have fun, say bye to all your friends like it's obviously it's hard to pick up and move and so i think i kind of like stayed like i wanted to give them space um, I, I didn't know who all was coming versus who all was staying in yeah. Tempe. Yeah. So it was like another one of those things where I was like, I'm just going to wait for people to announce they're coming with them. Um, in terms of like this fall so far, since I was gone, you know, the beginning of the fall, pretty much the end of summer after getting married, yeah. going on a honeymoon. Um, you know, I wasn't here when a lot of them got here. Reagan got here, um, it's sometime in the last two weeks and has been shown up to practice, which has been fun. Cause I've known Reagan since I was like, you know, I think 15 is when I met her on my first junior team trip. And so, wow. um, and I've trained with her a couple of times at like the OTC and stuff, and she is such a beast in practice. And so that's been cool to actually get to see that. And I'm excited to see that like every single day, but, yeah. um, you know, she's, she's starting. And I know that's just a hard position where it's like, you go from a place you love with friends to a place where you know nobody and it's going to be like a hard transition. And so, I obviously hope I can be someone that's like a familiar face at practice. Hubie has seemed like he's done it so seamlessly. <laughs> like Hubie <laughs> is like just so already a part of the team and like just kind of doing, doing his own thing. And, um, you know, shows up to practice kind of, he's like our Bob whisperer. Like we show up to practice in the locker room and Hubie's <laughs> like practice is probably going to be something around this. And he's normally right. Um, and so like, we're all like Hubie, what's, what's today going to be like, um, <laughs> And so, and Hubie's been great for me because I've been racing him nearly every day. We almost always go in the lane next to each other okay. freestyle. I mean, when it's, when it's sprint freestyle, um, or like threshold freestyle, we're great training partners together for that. And then, um, I've been mainly doing butterfly while he does backstroke and we pair up really nicely when we do that as well. So, um, Hubie's been a great addition for me, um, as like a fun person to have on deck and in the locker room, but also a great training partner. Have you guys talked about, um, I know he's not coming now, but when he does come, Leon, because he's just changed and there's so much spotlight on him and, and you know, he was another bubble and it's going to be difficult for him personally to come across and, 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 and have you guys prepared for that or thought about as teammates? Plus, he's one of your biggest rivals, obviously, 
you know, that mm-hmm. we talked about his, his when he's coming and how to help him get back into his groove. I don't know. No, I haven't. I haven't. We have. I mean, there hasn't been much talk about it. I obviously, I'm extremely excited about it. I'm. I'm like. I don't know. Like, I know Leon in a sense of like we compete against each other, and so like we have conversations at meets. But like, me and Leon aren't like you know texting on the regular and like checking in <laughs> with each other. So we're not like close like that. But I'm excited to kind of get to know Leon better. Um, you know, everything I've heard about him is that he's a, you know, he's a great swimmer, but like. He also yeah. on the day to day, he's not like obsessed with yeah. swimming. Like he has a he has interests and in a life outside of swimming, which I think is so cool. And yeah. um, I'm excited to hopefully, as you know, as another member of the pro group, become um, you know closer friends with him. Uh, but I'm just excited to train with him. I think that's been one of the coolest things. Is sometimes when we do a set, I'm like, I've wanted to ask Bob or I've asked you be like, okay, wh- like what what would Leon go on this set? Just like as as a rough marker for like. Um, you know, the best in the world. Like what, what is he typically going on this type of set? And so I'm excited to see that when he's in Austin um, and when we get the train together, because, you know, I, when that was one of the main, main exciting points for me when Bob got the job is that I'll get the train with Leon. Um, and so uh, obviously there hasn't been much talk about it because it's a few months down the line and he's, you know, he's got a lot of racing between world cups and, and short course worlds before that. So he's training and he's training in France. So, um, but I'm excited for when it happens. Yeah. I, I remember in my thirties when I was in pretty good shape still, and I was a king of the pool. I was winning all the workouts. Long time ago. <laughs> and this, and this, tw- this, this 21 year old guy comes from college and he starts kicking my ass. And I was like, Nope, that's not going to happen. I'm going to take him down. I think I was killing <laughs> myself for shallow water blackout. And then Brian Lundquist shows up, a, a former world record holder. I'm like, okay, I, I give up. I'm done, right? But Brian, you've been you've been in a team and you've seen that happen with the best in the world. You've seen Caesar and Fred go head to head. And it's like, it's, it can be counterproductive or productive. I mean, you want to talk about that? And Carson, you're like that. You're the king of the pool for the I am. And now you're going to have like, hello. It's, it's, it's interesting, right? That dynamic, it's fun. As all swimmers, we don't let somebody beat me. I mean, uh-huh. yeah, I can't totally. beat you, Carson. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, I think I was going to say, Carson, I, I mean, I, so I was training with Fred and Caesar, the, the two guys that have been sub 21 in the 50 freestyle at the same time in the same training group. And, you know, two different nations, same coach, same training group, um, but like competing head to head on a daily basis. But I also think like um, they're, the personalities matter so much, too. And so, like, you know, I, when I think about like the coaching transition for you to Bob, uh, there's like there was one person who stood out the most in the announcement of that. And that was you because I'm like, oh, like what a cool opportunity for Carson. First of all, like the coaching program is the best possible. Second, he gets that opportunity to race head to head with not only uh, Leon, but also Hubie and uh, knowing your st- strengths and backstroke too. And so like, I, I think, um, uh, and yet that said, I don't think that Bob's been in this position before either. Uh, he's always had like with Michael as the alpha and from what I've heard and other people who trained in, you know, back in the club Wolverine days and some of that training group, there was a clear alpha in that group. And then everybody else was, uh, you know, there too. And so, uh, you know, but, uh, so t- I think it'll be a learning opportunity for Bob as well. Uh, and for Leon. Um, and I don't think it's, but those two have a different history than Michael and Bob had too. Mm-hmm. you know, Michael and Bob were yeah. together for a really long time. Leon and Bob have been together, but it's a different dynamic. And so I, I would expect it to be a different one, but no doubt, like when it comes to, you know, pep talk before, uh, you know, the big event and it's like, okay, we're walking out for finals at worlds or, you know, f- finals at, at trials. You're going to be going, Hey coach, what do I need to do? You know, at, or what final <laughs> insights? I mean, all that. And so I don't know. It's all about like where the athletes take it. You, you both strike me having spoken to, to you a couple of times and then also to lay on a few times uh, and Bob, like the whole thing. I think, I think you'll all be pretty mature about it. Yeah. I'm, I'm excited about, it. I think also kind of Luke, what you were saying with, with the, you know, having new people in the group that like yeah. I have been, I feel, and I, I, I definitely think I've been, you know, the top, at least trainer. Um, mm-hmm. You know, we have, it's hard for me to say top person in the team when you got Luke Hobson, you know, he's been doing sure. his thing and, and you got so many other guys who are, you know, making national teams, making the Olympics. And so I, I don't feel comfortable saying like I've been the definitive best swimmer at Texas 
Um, I do feel like I've been the best trainer at Texas over the last four years. Um, that's something where I feel like I can show up day to day and, and throw down in practice. That's something that's one of my biggest strengths in swimming. One of the things I love most about swimming is showing up to practice and ripping. And so, um, with the new training group, it's been so much harder to win every day. Um, <laughs> that's and awesome. like, yeah. And like mm-hmm. Rex Maurer is like probably Reckon. the hardest person to be in practice that I've ever raced ever. And like, so he's incredible. Aaron Shackle can throw down. Mm-hmm. Hubie is obviously, you know, he's an Olympic champion for a reason. He's the best kicker that I've ever trained with. And also, you know, obviously the best backstroker I've ever trained with, you know, Michael Cotter's over there doing freestyle kick and, and, um, and, you know, pace freestyle. And then you got the guys who have been here a, a while with, you know, Kobe is a great swimmer and been on world championship teams, Luke Hobson, you know, bronze medal. So there's people literally everywhere. And I think that's been, I think it's going to be helpful for me. It's been definitely a transition because it's been like, oh, like I'm so competitive that I'm like, <laughs> I want to win every single set. I want to win yep. no matter if it's warm up or what I want to be the first. <laughs> one. And so, and that's, I think been one of my strengths, uh, right. But at the same time, because I've been so successful in practice and winning consistently over the last four years, I think when I get to the meet sometimes in the past, it's been like, oh, no, I hope I don't lose. Like, I'm mm. not used to losing. Yeah. Um, and mm. so I think it created almost like a fear of losing. And I think that kind of played into what I struggled with for a while with, like, my performance anxiety over, like, oh, I really don't want to lose. I just don't want to lose. And I became I started to swim not to lose rather than swimming to win. And so – um, I think that's something that's going to be a huge benefit to me with having this incredible training group is like, whether I like it or not, I'm going to have to get used to losing some days. Like mm-hmm. with the training group we have, it's going to be, and I've been, I've been super, super good in practice. I have felt the first couple four weeks, but like, whether I like it or not, it's going to be next to impossible for me to win every mm-hmm. single day with the group we got. So especially when Leon gets here. So um, I think that's going to be helpful for me to be like, you know what? I can focus on doing my best. I'm going to execute the way I need to execute. And when I'm feeling good, I'm going to be one of the hardest guys in the pool to beat, but you know, everyone's in a different place. And so, um, I, I'm excited about that aspect of the training group as well. Mm-hmm. So many new variables, but let's look down the line. Let's say we're like a year down the line. So everyone kind of knows each other a little bit. Mm-hmm. One day Carson's going to show up and he's not going to be having a good workout. It's just not going to be grooving for him. What do you want your teammates to talk to you or say to you, what do you want Bob to say to you? What type of environment do you think is going to help you get the best out of you to get to that next level? And Luke has his book that he's been pointing out for every episode, <laughs> chop wood, carry water. So is it that or, or what, what type of thing do you need? I think something that a, I think in the past it's been, I haven't been the best on those workouts. Like I've gotten super, super down on myself where it's like, Oh, I need to be the best. I really want to be the best. And so bad practice for me was like, it would, it would, you know, affect my mood past when I left the pool. Um, you know, I think this year and with a lot of the work I've been doing, um, with my performance coach, but also, you know, in my journey and my faith and, um, you know, having Meredith down here full time helps a lot with balance and perspective. Um, you know, one of the, one of my biggest goals for this season, especially as a pro is like, I want to be kind of like, you know, I don't have full involvement on the team in terms of a leadership position because that's not my role anymore. Like I'm not on the yeah. team. I'm not traveling to meets. I can't be the team leader. And I, and I don't think that that's my role regardless. And so, um, I want to be the, like, kind of like the, the glue guy in the group of like, you know, I, I know I have, you know, a, a little bit bigger of a spotlight on me because, you know, of the last couple of years. And, um, and so, I can, I want to be that guy where the freshmen can come in and feel comfortable talking to me and I can kind of take them in. I can support the guys on the days where, you know, I'm not feeling great. Like it was so hard for me, but like, I I've been trying to commit to this goal of just being the supportive teammate. Um, and you know, lifting everyone up cause you know, high tide lifts all the boats. And so, um, yes, the other day I got beat, I got beat in a freestyle set that normally I'm pretty good at. Um, and I was just like, Oh, I'm so frustrated internally. But then I was like, every time I get to the wall, I'm going to encourage the guy next to me, the guy who's beating me. And like, I just kept doing it. And like, as he got faster, I got faster. And so, um, that was just one of those things where it's like, all I can, it doesn't matter how fast everyone else is going because the only thing that swimming is such an individual sport where it's like, 
all I can control is how fast I'm going. And all I can control is if I'm executing the way I need to execute, because that's what's going to provide best times for me. And I can't control, you know, how much time this person drops or how fast this person's going. Um, that's just out of my control. You w- words like what you just said, we had you on what, two, three years ago, and y- you sound different. You're, you're coming across differently. Um, I want to talk about like definitely how this summer you, you got a fourth in 200 IM, you got a bronze in the four, you got a silver in the relay, and you got a gold in Meredith. Let's talk about how has that shaped you and become who you are. Talk about how great that was. You got four fucking great things happening, uh-huh. especially Meredith. Talk about that. Yeah. So, the, I mean, this summer was, I, I told Meredith this, we were on the honeymoon and I said, um, I was in terms of like everything. So in terms of, I guess I'll go back. 2024 in my eyes was like an incredibly intimidating year. Um, and like, I think in the back of my mind, there was excitement about getting married right after the Olympics, because I was like, no matter what happens, I have the best thing regardless. Afterwards, I'm going to, I'm going to get to go home, get married, spend this amazing time with Meredith, but also with everyone that we love in Cincinnati, it's going to be just the best weekend. And it was, it was the greatest weekend. Also on the other side of the coin, I was like, if I don't make the Olympic team, am I going to be able to fully enjoy this season of life of leading into marriage? Like, will that affect me? Because this is what I, this is what I do. There's a part of me that, you know, has always had a problem with putting my self-worth into performance. And, um, you know, if I miss the Olympic team again, is that going to disrupt kind of what this season of life should be like for me and Meredith? And so Mm -hmm. there was a stress of that. And so I think having the people I have in Austin, um, and you know, people I've worked with all year, like my performance coach and, and, you know, great friends I have down in here in Austin that are with involved in swimming and also some that are not involved in swimming whatsoever, had no, really no idea about swimming until they became friends with me, um, have been so helpful in terms of like the lead up to trials and like trials was the most fun I've ever had at a meet which sure. I cannot believe I'm saying that, but like yeah, yeah. I look back and I'm like that, if I could go back and relive that again, I would do it a hundred times over. It was just the greatest week in terms of experiences, feeling like just, I'm in, so in love with this sport. Um, yeah. I'm, I, you know, I love the process. I love the grind of coming in day in, day out, managing my energy saying hi to the crowds, you know, the crowd's so loud that the pressure, you know, the pressure feels good. Um, and that's something that I haven't felt in such a long time, um, before that. And I think it was because of a better balance, um, with, you know, my life in sport and out of sport. And, um, so obviously that was great. The Olympics was fun. Um, the Olympics was a little bit, uh, you know, a lot of things out of my control, which in the past has really bothered me. Um, especially when I'm a swimming and I want to do my best when things are out of my control, it's been yeah, a yeah. spot of like, just don't like that. Like, like the bus rides or like the, uh, <laughs> the lays or the food or whatever it was. I was like, Oh, yeah. why can't I just have it like trials where I could just get Chipotle, live five <laughs> minutes away from the pool, show up whatever I want, um, easily access Starbucks, yeah. uh, like all of these things. And so, uh, but you know, leaving with two medals, um, and you know, being able to say, you know, I'm an Olympic medalist for the rest of my life. Like that's something that'll never go away. Um, always be an Olympic medalist. And that's like just something that I've dreamed about my entire life. Uh, and so um, that was an incredible experience. And then coming home for the best thing of all, like obviously the um, Meredith and I have been together for a little over seven years in terms of dating. Oh, cool. um, and so to finally get to, you know, marry her, uh, wasn't really like a surprise to either of us. Like we both kind of knew a couple years into our relationship, like you're the person I want to be with. Um, but to finally be able to celebrate that and to have our friends come to Cincinnati, um, it truly was the best <laughs> night ever. Um, and the, just the whole weekend was incredible. And so I brings me back to what I was saying at the beginning of like, I we were on the honeymoon and I was talking to Meredith. I was like, to be honest, like, I think if I could have imagined the perfect 2024 a year ago, this would have beaten it. Oh, wow. Like, hmm. This this would have been better than I could have imagined okay. in terms of like my mental prep going in, how much I enjoyed it. My results were like, obviously, I, I would have loved to do a little bit better at the Olympics. 
but my results were still like good enough to get me two medals. And then we just had the most incredible weekend with all of, all the people we love in Cincinnati. So it was, it was an, a truly incredible year. So being a Southwest Ohio boy, I assume the reception was at Kings Island eating a Skyline Coney on the beast or what was it? <laughs> no, the, uh, we got married at the monastery, which is a beautiful venue in Cincinnati. Uh, and we, a lot of people did, everyone tried, a lot of people tried graders um <laughs> some people tried skyline some of my groomsmen got in a couple of days early and so the first place i took them was skyline i'm not a big skyline person myself like i just didn't grow up i, didn't, I wasn't born in cincinnati so my yeah. family didn't grow up like every sunday we go to skyline um i like it it just normally makes me doesn't doesn't make me feel great afterwards yeah, i thought you were going to be having that not chipotle at trials between <laughs> sessions right <laughs> but yeah that would be that would be <laughs> wait i had graders for the first time recently what's your flavor go to there my my B- buckeye blitz is like my normal like if i'm in cincinnati for a prolonged period of time we're going a couple times i get buckeye blitz that's the one um, i got it but was the raspberry one mm-hmm. the raspberry the raspberry. Ones, mm-hmm. if i'm in town for like a day and we go i'm like i'm getting the raspberry that's like the one where <laughs> yeah. you have to get at least once where you're home because it's like their thing yeah. Is this ice cream? Is this pie? What is this? It's ice, ice cream. cream. Yeah. Okay, got no idea. <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. I want to go to this one because we didn't get a chance to talk about this yet. Uh, Shane uh, and being able to to train with him and then see him make his first team, especially after you had made your uh, you know got your spot on the team earlier in the week and had gone through that emotional process and then got to share that moment with him. Um, yeah, what was that like? It looked awesome. It was awesome. That was one of my favorite moments ever in swimming was um, Shane and I had talked the whole year about going one, two in that race and just like, you know, I don't know, just knowing that him and I felt like we were the best 200 diameters in the country the entire year um, and knew that that was what we both wanted to do and the event we were both really dialed in on. And so, um, you know, finally getting there and like we both were, I would say, fairly inconsistent throughout this whole year um in terms of race results and so like some points in the year where i was like oh i don't know maybe maybe neither of us will make that event maybe one of us will um but like even going into the final i was like i don't know chase looked amazing in that semi-final and so i was like that might be a spot for might be we might both be going for the second spot in this final and so um to turn i mean once shane was out and you know whatever was 52 and i knew i was out in 53 because i i kind of gotten to the point where I know what that feels like. Um, and so when I saw him out that fast in that final, I was like, Chain's going to make it because his brush stroke is solid and, and he's not going to come home that slow in freestyle. Like he's not going to be above a 30. And so I was like, Shane's got it. Let me just turn it on and make sure I'm going to. And I just had a surge at the end, but like that moment with him where, you know, I've never seen Shane get emotional like that. And so um, that was so fun to share that and be the one that's like in the water with him and, and gets to experience that moment with him. Um, and then also, you know, that was Ed and Wyatt's last swim at trials. We were the last two, wow. you know, Longhorn or a Dave, Dave swam the mile the last day of the meet, but he wasn't training with us this year. So, um, you know, we were Eddie and Wyatt's last swim of the meet. And so that was just so special. And we, since we both made it, we got to have two Texas coaches for the awards ceremony. So Eddie and Wyatt got to go out, Um, and so that was just such a, you know, special moment with like full circle of like, oh, thank you so much, Eddie and Wyatt for everything you've done for us, because like without them, we're not here. Um, and so, and then also to share that with Shane where, you know, Shane has just been kind of gifted the, you know, label of the like bad boy in swimming. Um, you know, it's everyone, it's the label that everyone, you know, has tried to put on in the last couple of years and, um, I think Shane kind of likes it. Like, I think there's sometimes where he kind of likes it. And I think there's sometimes where it's kind of unfair and puts a little bit more pressure on him where like, and I feel like I felt this before in, in, you know, periods of my swim career where it's almost like people are wanting you to do bad, um, because they think it's funny and mm-hmm. like, they think it's funny how consistent and how like a pattern of like underperforming in big moments is like turns into a pattern and people almost cheer for it, which is yeah. like, it's just the world we live in, you know, it's like, sure. I felt like I had that when I was struggling to swim fast in finals where people wanted me to swim bad because they thought it was funny, similar with Shane the past right. year and a half. And so to see him finally just like break through and, you know, go 155.8 when no one thought he was going to do it was so cool. Yeah, totally. 
I mean, the, the, that whole, but if you're not a fan of swimming for the listeners, I encourage you just to watch that race. I uh, know that Shane, Shane didn't look good in the prelims and he didn't look good in the semis. We, but watch Shane as he walked on deck and as he got behind the blocks, look at him talking to himself. Look at his attitude. Look at his confidence he had. And then, of course, look at how he was under world record place in the 150. And then look how the two of you came together on his emotion. That, to me, is why we life. this sport is the greatest sport in the world because mm-hmm. of what he turned around. But also, Carson, I'm going to ask you, you came back in a 27.5. What the heck? <laughs> you didn't turn it on. Talk, uh, how are you prepared for that? I mean, you were a second and a half behind. You mowed down people. How's that feeling? How good did you feel? You just sort of had the confidence of qualifying already. What made you go 27.5, dude? I think that was, I mean, the 27, I, I mean, that's something where I feel like that's been like the missing puzzle piece for me in the IMs over the last couple of years of like, yeah. how do I go, you know, 145 and like a one, I'm capable of 143s on relays in the 200 free, but then like I come home and like eight high and 58 mid in the 4 a.m. Like what's going Like, I feel like I should be better than that, especially in, in the 400 free. I'm, I'm a guy who I think I could be sub 345 and I think I could be sub 45, 345 consistently. And so I'm like, that's definitely like a weird part of my swimming where I can't figure out what the inefficiency is in my race of what's causing that. But to be able to do that at trials was really cool. Um, it was, I think mainly just a execution thing where we went into it knowing, okay, 4am, the plan was to swim trials a little bit more conservatively. Um, you know, make sure that back end is there. Um, you know, I don't need to take it out at trials in a 155. You know, I need to control the race and make sure that I'm beating everyone that last 100 and that last 150, which I felt like I executed perfectly. Um, the 200 IM was more of, you know, Shane's going to be lightning quick. I'm going to, you know, stay attached to him, but I'm going to work my strengths. I'm the best 200 freestyler in this field. So I'm going to come home and, and I'm going to beat everyone that last 50 and that last, you know, 75. And so I think it was a confidence thing. Like I said, trials is like the most fun I've ever, ha- ever had at a swim meet. And mm-hmm. so I think my confidence was through the roof in terms of like, I can swim this however I want and I can win. Like yeah, that's sure. kind of my mindset that I had in both races over like, I can choose how I want to swim this and I can win. And that might not always be the case, but like, I feel like when I'm thinking that and that's my mindset, it is, it is the case. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think that was mainly, I just turned my brain off and, you know, I was smiling that last 25 because I was like, <laughs> oh, me and Shane are going to go one, two. Um, and so I think I kind of just didn't focus on like, oh, my legs hurt so bad. I was just like, <laughs> I'm feeling so good. Shane's going to make it like, this is going to be such a great night. Um, and I think that's kind of where the 27.5 came from. Now, there were a lot of sibling talks at, at trials and you had, you know, the Walshes, you had the Shackles and then. You know, you, you, you and your brother, Jake and Jake, unfortunately, getting sixth and then seventh in the 100 and 200 breaststroke. What was your thought when you saw Jake finish and probably knowing that was his last swim? Ooh, that was a, such a heavy night. And that was the, actually the night before my 2 a.m. prelim. Um, and, mm-hmm. you know, obviously a typical night before I swim, especially at a big meet like that, is I'm not at the meet. I'm, if I'm not swimming, I'm, I'm chilling at the Airbnb or I'm at the hotel. Like, I'm not going to go over there and just sit. Um, but I walked over there for that race, um, for his 200, I was in drug testing for the hundred because the same night as the 4am. So like I watched it on my phone. Um, but I kind of knew the 200 is where, you know, he felt like he had the best shot. So the 200, we were over there and yeah, it's like, I could just tell at the, you know, the 75 mark, I was like, he just doesn't have it. Like he doesn't have the pop. And, um, and so it was like, that's 75 left. I just started walking, walking to, um, where the athletes come down after. Um, cause I was like, Oh, like someone, like someone's got to be there for him. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I want to be that person. And so that was, that was definitely super hard of seeing Jake emotional. Like Jake is like my biggest role model. And so it's like, it's, I won't say it's like, it's different than this, but also felt the same of like, it's like when you see your dad cry, like you look up to your dad and when you see your parents cry, it's like, Oh, like that hurts. And so like seeing Jake cry and Jake is normally so emotionally stable. Um, so seeing him cry and and just be like, Oh, like I really wanted it. And, you know, I can't believe it's over. Like that was my last swim. Um, that was super hard. Uh, and then seeing my whole family kind of be there for him at the Airbnb and just, you know, 
it's it's impossible when when I love Jake that much to not take on that emotion as well of like I want that for him. I probably want that even more than he wanted it for him. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so that was a super hard night. Uh, but I mean, Jake has had such an incredible swim career. Mm-hmm. Obviously, it's hard, and I know it's hard when it's. I think for a lot of his career is a little bit compared to me, which definitely wasn't easy on on him. Yeah. Um, just like if my academic, uh, my academics were always compared. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, it, it was. It's definitely been. It's definitely that's been one of the weird parts about this year is not having Jacob practice every day. Yeah. Yeah, I remember when we talked to him last year, you know, he was kind of just reflecting on still being on this path of discovery of this, you know, resurgence or like a a new leaf unturned and all the gains that he was making in breaststroke Mm -hmm. and how much fun that was and and is. And um, and so I I wonder just about like, uh, is there anything that you'll take away from kind of that final chapter of of his swimming career where, you know, uh, yeah, he just uh, like discovered this place and then pursued a, 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 a new path and was swimming like world elite breaststroke with a very serious uh, shot at, you know, making a team and even meddling if, you know, that, that's where the potential looked like it, you know, could could be. I know he believed that and you believe yeah. that. So I'm just curious, like, yeah, if there's anything that you'll carry with you, especially from like kind of this final phase for him. In terms of my swimming, I'm not sure. Like it would probably that probably takes some reflecting on me to like really analyze it. In terms of Jake's Jake's life, I think it showed me like Jake is gonna be good at whatever he does. Like yeah. Jake has always kind of been that way over like he's probably the most like nose to the grindstone hard working person I've ever met in my life. And like um very similar to my dad, very similar work ethic to my dad and my dad's job. But like Jake is someone who like when he want something like he would literally do everything possible to make that happen like he will literally like in school and it's like jake is is when it, jake is going to be the most incredible doctor he's going to be the most incredible med school student because he is so locked in on the process and he loves the process of it um and so when jake got that like resurgence of breaststroke he was just obsessive about being good at breaststroke and like just so excited about the possibility of becoming so much better in breaststroke Um, And I think I've seen that with like his new kind of like phase of life with med school. Like he, he's, he's super busy. Obviously I don't see him as much as I used to see him when I saw him every day, but like every time I see him, he's talking to me about what he's learning in med school and how excited he is. Something, most of the stuff I don't really understand. Um, But like, he's just so excited about it. He's gotten into running and like now he's training for like a half marathon because then he's like, I want to do a half marathon and a full marathon. Like, he just has like an incredible work ethic. Um, and I think it just, show, I mean, it just not that it like showed me because I always knew it was there, but it was really, really, really fun to see him get excited about something and like go all in and pursue it. Because I know that's what, you know, this next chapter for him in med school and, you know, the medical world is going to look like. Um, that's awesome. Yeah. Good, good for him. And we wish shake well for sure. Uh, I want to turn back to something that came up when we were talking about uh, Shane and how fast he went out in that IM. And then also we think about like potential with, um, you know, Bob and where Leon's brought the four IM. Uh, I wonder about like, you know, when you see somebody like Michael Andrew and the way he swam the two IM and the way Shane swims the two IM, they're, they're putting these splits out there that, are a bit different. And it made me wonder when you go to goal setting for say the four IM, are you thinking about what does it take for me to go three fifty nine? What does it take to go three fifty eight? Or are you going, what does it take to go four oh two, four oh one and win a world title? Like at, at what point is it like, you know, because I remember maybe it was Dressel at some point, it was talking about how like goals should be like kind of make you laugh <laughs> at the same time that they, mm-hmm. they should be half serious and they should half make you laugh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they seem so crazy. And I just wonder like with some of the, the way that these guys have swim the two I am, it makes me think that those are like splits that you, pr- that's not the way you would swim it. But if you can split it that way on the front end and swim a freestyle the way that, you know, on the back end, then you are going to go, you know, one, yeah. two, <laughs> yeah, that's that's been something that, this is this is definitely something that's been new for me this mindset of um where my my goals used to be very similar to like what Caleb said like very out there very lofty 
Um, and I think that's really awesome for motivation. Um, I think for me, when like, when I'm looking at splits, I'm looking at how do I go 406.55, you know, how do I go my best time? You know, I, I want to, I want to be faster than I've ever been before. The first step to me going 403.8, which, you know, by the end of my career, I want to get that American record. That would be, that would be like, if I, when I started swimming the 4am, you know, however many years ago it was, I was like, how cool would it be to get that, you know, out of my like utmost respect for Phelps and like that, the incredible career he had, I want to get the record that everyone said was the hardest to break, just the competitive side of me. Um, and I still think that's the hardest American record. Um, maybe it's too free might be a little harder, but the, um, the 400 IM is definitely up there. And so the first step to me getting down to that range, because frankly, I'm not that close right now, you know, I have three seconds to drop. And so, um, the first step to me getting there is to go four of six, five, five is to get faster than what I've ever been before. And so when I go to practice, I'm like, all right, how do I, how do I just improve all of my strokes just a little bit to where I'm better than I've ever been in all of them. And, the more, the more I can attack that and the more I can, you know, go into the meet with the confidence of like, I know for a fact, my fly back and breast and free are all better than they've ever been. And my endurance is better. This should produce a best time. And, you know, I really liked what Leon said at, um, NCAAs. I saw an interview after his five free of like, I didn't have a goal time because the sky is the limit for what I could have gone. Right. You know? how cool is that mindset to where it's like, I'm just going to go out there and rip and let's see what the time's going to be. Um, and so ever since then, that's kind of been my idea of like, that's a great, obviously I'm always shooting for best times, but like, I want to go out there and just see who knows what's possible. The only person that's putting limits on me is my brain and my body. And Noah Lyle said the same thing when he said something about, I think it was about the 400. He wanted to do the Mm -hmm. 400 and he put a time out there and they were like, you think you can do that? And he was like, he goes, my, my body can, my brain just doesn't know it yet. Like your body doesn't know what you're capable of. It's only your brain telling. And I, and I know it always doesn't always work like that, but I just thought that's such a cool mindset to have in terms of like improvement and goal setting. Yeah. Yeah. Leon also said after the race, shit, my legs hurt. Yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> so you gotta have that which i'm sure you do after pretty much every race um all right also like what's this what's your take on everybody um hating on the the men's performance in paris the u.s men i mean obviously i you don't want to be the team that gets you know kind of like pooped on in the media obviously <laughs> I want to be on a team that like it's similar to, you know, being a Texas swim fan and, um, you know, getting seventh, like it's, it's not fun to be on a team that is historic for being not good or not as successful. Um, Uh, do I think all of it is fair? Probably not. Like the the world is just getting faster and like Mm -hmm. the world, obviously we were so dominant in the Phelps Lochte era, um, of those guys, and the world was a little bit further behind, but that's just one of those things that like none of the American guys can control that. Like we can't control how fast these Europeans are getting. We can't control, you know, if, if, you know, I don't know if this is the reason, but like there are a lot more Europeans and, and um, other countries that are coming over to train in the United States. And I think the NCAA system does positively impact you as a swimmer. I think it, it develops you into a swimmer that, you know, is very unique and, and I think that they're getting opportunities that are improving their swimming performance. And, um, you know, I think the the thing that I was like, when everyone was like, I hope they're refocusing and I hope they're going to really take this back. Like that was the part where I was like, you don't think we went to the Olympics and tried as hard as we could? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, like I want, I yeah, want, yeah. I want to win all the medals. Like I, I did my best. And so I think that's <laughs> the part where I was like, I get, I get that people are like, all right, we need to develop these swimmers better. And I think there is some capacity where it's like, okay, we probably could look at the development in the United States in terms of the men and what are we doing with the women that's made them so successful over the last couple of years that the men are somewhat lacking. I'm not smart enough to answer that question. I think that's something that could be looked at, 
And I, like, I, I don't know if that's even needed, but I think the idea of like the men need to lock in and swim better is a bad argument. <laughs> <laughs> well, the other the other argument that I th- had to laugh at was all the like mainstream media who don't follow swimming or know know it at all are talking about like feeling slighted that uh, Bob coached Leon and like you know America's coach is coaching the star of another team and like how that's misallocating resources or something absurd you know just like no. come on stop well that's and that's the other thing that was the other thing too with. Um, I think the the media it's hard on the because I thought the coaches of the United States team did an amazing job this summer. I thought Coach Desorbo and Coach Nesty were incredible leaders for Team USA. I thought all the assistants did an incredible job. A lot of people don't understand that the way that training camp works is yeah. that everyone's pretty much doing what their home coach is sending them. Right. It's not like Coach Nesty and Coach Desorbo are giving us sets that we're doing as a whole team and like. <laughs> We all missed our, we all like the people who swam not great missed their taper because of something that a coach on staff did. Yeah. It was other, due to other factors. You know, it's like we were getting our workouts, everyone was doing getting their workouts from their home coach or working with a coach that was working with their home coach. So um, I think there's just a misunderstanding too of kind of how that stuff works and like um, the ins and outs. And so, like, because I didn't like seeing like, oh, someone must have, like, one of these head, just uh, coach the or coach Nessie must have really messed up one of these sets. Like this, this area of their swimming is really lacking. And it's like, that wasn't them. Like they're, they're focused on their swimmers at training camp. They're, they're focused yeah. on team building obviously, but like in terms of training, it's like everyone's doing what their home coach is telling them to do. Yeah. This is not the miracle on ice. You know, they didn't uh-huh. swim the team <laughs> themselves and then try to like <laughs> coach them up. Uh-huh. Uh, Luke, Luke had one for you. Yeah, man. I was going to say, you know, they say a happy swimmer, it's a fast summer, right? And you definitely were very happy at trials and you kicked about the trials. But you also scratched four events, right? Two fly, two back, two free, one free. Mm-hmm. Say, and for reasons of scheduling, timing, sleep, all that stuff, what if you could have managed to get one more in and your choice? Which one would you have like, oh, uh, we've all wished that when we're on f- top of it, I wish I swam this because I'm sure I would have. Which of those swims you wish you could have fit in somehow because you knew it would be uh, that's a great question. Um, I mean, in terms of sch- if scheduling didn't matter, yeah. uh, I think my best event last summer, I think I could have had a really good 400 free. Um, mm. I don't think I was ever th- really heavily considering doing it because I knew my best shot of getting on the Olympic team was in the 4 a.m. and I didn't want to mess mm. that up. Yeah, yeah. Um, I also think in terms of like a train in terms of training, and I'm not saying this is a negative, this is just kind of how Texas training was with Eddie and Wyatt was, it was centered around building up. And I think probably because we really only went fast one day a week on Fridays, um, but it was building up and we were going to absolutely rip. So we were all really good at ripping, you know, one or two events, um, a week. And then also at meets. Um, and so I think my confidence of swimming more than that wasn't super high. And so when when I was scratching all these events, one, it was due to scheduling. I would have loved to swim the two fly this summer. I felt like that could have been good. I, and I know I'm good at two fly, but I couldn't have been on the eight free relay in Paris if I did the two fly. And so mm-hmm. I don't think many people knew that at trials, but like we looked at that before trials and we we're like, we're going to enter this because if I miss the 4 a.m., yeah. I think I can put myself on the team in the two fly, but if we make the four AM, I'm not swimming it. And mm-hmm. so, um, and so there was like decisions made. I would have loved to swim the four free. I think that's an event where I want to start exploring. It's just so hard with like order of events. Yeah, yeah. All right, dude. We just got a few rapid fire, and we'll let you go. Great. What are you reading, watching, or listening to right now? Ooh, read, reading. So I saw Greg Harden, the Michigan um, sports psychologist, just passed away. And I have a book by him that I never read called uh, Staying Sane in an Insane World, something like that. It was like staying sane in an insane. I was something along those lines. And so um, I'm starting to read that because I was like, everyone talks so highly of him. So I'm going to look into it. Nice. Uh, what's the, this one's from a, a audience member of ours, Miles Burke 24 says, what's the hardest set you've ever done? Hardest sets, hardest set ever is really hard because I've done a, about a million practices in my life and <laughs> sure. most have been super hard. I'll give you the hardest one we've done all year, um, in my opinion, with Bob was last Wednesday. It was a 
200 IM uh, or a 200 freestyle on 220 and then four 200 IMs on 220 uh, hold as fast as you can hold. And then a 400 free uh, on 440 and then three 200 IMs on 220 hold as fast as you can hold. 600 free, three 200 IMs on 215, hold as fast as you can hold. 600 free, and then 100, uh, 100, one 200 IM all out, and then 800 free, or some, something along those lines. It's called the Jana Evans set. That's what Bob said it was. It was stupid mm. hard. <laughs> that sounds yeah. brutal. All right, some trivia for you. So uh, Sunday is the fall equinox. What exactly does that mean? Is that when it turns in, uh, summer into fall? Yes, but more specifically, what happens? <laughs> the leaves start falling off the trees. The sun's <laughs> rays uh, directly start hitting below the equator. That's the official answer. Uh, all right. If you um, could do, I, I follow this thing in track where uh, Mondo Duplantis, the world record holder in the pole vault, just did a challenge a uh, 100 meter sprint race against uh, Karsten Warholm, the 400 hurdles uh, world record holder. Mm-hmm. Um, if you saw that in swimming, Let's say you go to a tier pro series this season. What event and who do you, what are you going to do? Could be off distance, could be off stroke. Call somebody out. Who are you going to race and what's it going to be in? As a, a real event? No. I mean, yeah, you're going to do it as a race, but more of a stunt. Uh, it's going to be a real event. Can't be, be like honest, 50 corkscrew. To be honest, no, this goes, <laughs> this goes back a little bit. I, and I've been thinking about this in practice. I want to race David Johnson in a, in a thousand yard freestyle. That's like, he, I mean, he's one of the best in history at it, and right. he's incredible yeah. at it. Spread eagle, like, eagle him. I, I think, I think, <laughs> I think if we went head to head, I could, I could hold my own. And if I'm on a good day, I think I could be, be right up there with him. And so right. I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say, thousand yard freestyle. Hold on, please tell me you've seen this clip. By the way, it's my favorite clip. I tell it to these guys sometimes. Um, where um, I think he was swimming at Short Course Worlds, and the commentator for David's race says, "David Johnson spread eagles the field." <laughs> <laughs> I have not seen that. <laughs> the American we'll send, record. Yeah. We'll send yeah. you the clip. It's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. And then um, uh, John's uh, um, wife just shared this uh, this this set with us, um, and I'm curious how many times you think you could do it. So, because uh, many years ago, I was part of a, a Gatorade chugging challenge uh, that went a bit viral on Flow Swimming in the day, um, where we chugged a Gatorade and then sprinted a hundred all out. So, uh, but this new iteration appears to be. Um, you chug a chocolate milk, you race a hundred all out. Then you eat a banana and you go a hundred all out. And then you chug a Sprite and you go a hundred all out. And, uh, I want to know how many times do you think you can do that? Is the end like throwing up? That's right. I, I can probably go. I literally can't throw up. Oh, I, really? That's been <laughs> one I'm, way to find out. <laughs> it's like a, it's a, you know, that might be a fun fact about me is that like, I don't know if it's just, I didn't learn. I didn't learn. I don't know how to burp either. Um, like, I don't know if I didn't learn how what? to burp when I was a baby. And so I can't really burp. And the only way I can throw up and like, this isn't like, I only would ever do this, obviously, if I feel sick and like I need to sure. is by like sticking my fingers down my throat and making sure. myself throw up. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so <laughs> unless I'm like sick, sick, and there's like projectile vomit, but like, I could right. probably do that until exhaustion. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> all right we got to know uh texas football then uh does arch manning uh relinquish the starter uh job to quinn yours or does he hold on to it tom brady style no i'm uh i'm a big quinn fan and a big arch fan i think arch is gonna probably win the heisman while he's at texas and probably win a national championship at texas but i think this is quinn's year I think Quinn's going to win a national championship for us this year. And I think Quinn will be in New York for the Heisman ceremony. Heisman favorite. Yeah, I love it. All right. Well, enjoy the football game. You go to the game, right? Meredith and I, we have season tickets. Meredith and I, we give our, we sold our, sold our tickets to my brother because we're taking a, taking a week off and just relaxing. Um, We're going to watch, we're going to watch it on the TV this week. Well, it is Louisiana Monroe, right? Or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. We got to say, we got to save our energy for SEC ball coming up. That's right. That's right. (laughs) 
Uh, well, thanks for thanks for making it work today, dude. Um, it's good to be able to catch up with you, and I'm excited for what's ahead. So, love to check in again. Uh, you know, before too long. Great. Thank you guys so much. This is fun. That's it for this episode of Social Kick. We'll see you next time. Hey, everybody. Thanks for hanging out with us. If you're enjoying Social Kick, tell your friends about it, and be sure to tell us what you liked by leaving a comment and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Follow us on Instagram. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel, The Social Kick. And you can find all of our content on our website at thesocialkick.com.